hello. Yes, um, I'm Liz Stokes. Um, I'm based an associate based in our Newcastle office, uh, and I'm going to be starting off today. Helen is going to do uh, a little bit later. But Helen's a partner who's based in our Manchester office, so um, we have spread across the north at the moment. Uh, but this is applicable, hopefully, to well anywhere across the country. And I know that they've got people on the call today from all over the place. Um, from my understanding is that most people are um, on the webinar from Acute Trust and that's sort of the, the target audience. So hopefully this will be applicable to you. But it's intended as a very much a sort of overview and introductory uh, session to understand more about the court of protection from a um, from an external position, basically. And when and the question is obviously when to involve the court of protection into matters that you might come across. Let's have a look at the Court of Protection. What is the Court of Protection? Um, the reputation of the Court of Protection is something that you might have come across in the press. And these are some quotes that you might have seen over the years in terms of um, the courts itself. There's a, 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 it sounds like on some occasion that the court is as a secret court, perhaps, or an area of law or an area of um, the judiciary that is not quite as well known as other areas um, and that its reputation is somewhat unknown. Hopefully, after today's session, we will have um, negated that uh, thinking and you'll be completely familiar with how it works and what it is. But um, there is still an aspect, I think, in the general public that may suggest that the Court of Protection is somewhat intimidating and hopefully this will help to demystify it a little bit. But in reality, despite these quotes, the Court of Protection is more transparent than it used to be. Uh, there is more in the press about the Court of Protection. There are, there are various... Um, uh, matters that come across the press and come uh, are involved in uh, legal blogs that you might come across to explain um, the actions and the decisions within the court. Um, there's an open justice project that you might have come across in terms of um, legal blogs and providing updates on various um, uh, cases. And the general rule under the court of protection is that hearings will be heard in private. However, there is a practice direction that provides that the court will ordinarily be um, uh, an attended hearing in public unless there is a transparency order. So there, there is an opening up of the courts over the last few years, which has meant that the decisions and um, determinations made within that court are becoming a lot more open and available to um, uh, parties to understand, to understand the rationale. So what are we going to look at this afternoon? This is the brief agenda, which we will whiz through at some high speed. So what is the Court of Protection? Um, what is it is, how it came about, um, uh, and what its powers and how it might be able to help? Um, best practice and uh, for applications and appearing in the Court of Protection, including what, what decisions might need to be taken to the Court of Protection um, in the first place. And then at the end, we'll look at some um, relevant case law um, in summary to come up to show to show you some recent decisions around the issues that we've been talking about. So the first point, what is the Court of Protection? So to give you a without giving you a full on history lesson, um, the brief history of Court of Protection is that it came about following the Lunacy Act in 1890 um, and was initially uh, provided the monarch authority over property um, uh, and affairs. Since 2007, the Court of Protection has been set up um, following the commencement of the Mental Capacity Act, and now the Com Court of Protection um, sits across the whole country. Judges therefore sit anywhere across England and Wales, and there are three tiers of judges, so they may either be Tier 1 District Judges, Tier 2 Circuit Judges, um, or Tier 3 High Court Judges, and those judges are usually um, judges who also sit in the family courts as well. Um, the role of the Court of Protection, as it says on, on this uh, slide is very much to make decisions on financial or welfare matters for people who cannot make their own decisions at the time they need to be made. So we'll come on to it in a moment, but central to that is that the Court of Protection makes decisions for those who do not have capacity to make their own decisions in respect of both financial and welfare. We'll be focusing on the welfare decisions today because that is usually where the, the um, health bodies are involved in uh, entering uh, into Court of Protection. So, as I said, the main court is in London, um, but there are regional courts across um, the country, Leeds, Newcastle, Manchester and Birmingham. Um, and also there will be sometimes more local courts. Um, 
Court of Protection, there are clear rules and um, practice directions, the Court of Protection rules from 2017, and these must be adhered to, but it is less structured than other uh, civil or the criminal courts. Um, it, it is an inquisitorial process rather than, than, than primarily adversarial, and it, it's about working for parties to work together to um, understand both whether an individual has capacity and, and what decision or de declaration is it or action is in the best interest of that individual. So the power of the court of protection, the intention of the court um, is to make declarations or um, decisions in relation to those individuals who lack capacity. So there are wide ranging powers um, and they, they are to an extent some, some similar powers as to um, the high court. You'll see from the headlines back on the first slide that there were various wide ranging decisions that can be made and wide ranging powers. Um, and these can relate to all aspects of, of welfare in this case, in which is the area we're looking at. Um, so the first power is for the ability to make declarations. Um, and this is a key power um, where they, a court can decide whether something is allowed, whether P being the person at the centre of the court of protection um, lacks capacity to make a decision or whether an act is lawful. Um, i.e. whether a serious medical treatment act is lawful. So there are declarations, so the lawfulness of any act done or yet to be done. Uh, and the second power to, to focus on is the, the ability for the court to make decisions. And those decisions can be across a wide range of issues in respect of uh, personal welfare um, in, for, as you, you're more familiar with, as health, as health uh, organisations. Um, but they can also be across issues of where to live, um, treatment issues, contact with specified people, uh, giving or refusing consent to treatment, and they can extend more broadly um, across an individual's property and affairs. Or they can, or can make a decision as to uh, the control and management of, of peace property, the execution of will and the conduct of legal proceedings. These are all powers that the court has um, uh, the ability to make decisions around. Um, the Court of Protection can also determine whether a lasting power of attorney or an enduring power of attorney is valid and can look at that um, in detail. And it can also remove or appoint deputies on behalf of an individual, but also, sorry, also remove deputies who, who don't carry out their duties uh, as they should be. Um, the Court can also issue declarations and award damages in respect of a breach of human rights, but it, at the, what the Court of Protection cannot do is consent on behalf of an individual. So central to the Court of Protection, and this is probably something of a recap for most of you who are on this call, um, and we're just going to have a look, at, very quickly look at a very back to basics issue, is capacity. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, the court deals with those individuals who lack capacity and enable for um, best interest to be decision, decisions to be made um, on their behalf. So capacity is central and you cannot get any further in the court of protection without looking at uh, capacity. And this is the hinge on which the court of protection application will hang. Um, capacity and assessment of capacity, as you're probably all aware, can form the subject of a, a, a webinar in its own right. So hopefully this will be particularly detailed. However, in summary, the point to take away is that it, at the heart of it, you need to remember the key principles of the key statutory principles when assessing capacity. And that is obviously, as you'll be aware, that um, you can't assume, sorry, P is assumed to have capacity unless it's established that they don't, um, that they're not treated as unable to make a decision unless all steps have been taken to assist with uh, making decision without any success. Um, they're not treated as lacking capacity just because an individual is making an unwind decision. And capacity can't be established on the base of age and uh, assumptions of appearance or uh, ethnicity and background. So it's important to start with those key principles in the background. If there are, um, uh, and the section 2.1 MCA definition of capacity is provided there for you. So a person lacks capacity in relation to a matter if at the material time he's unable to make a decision for themselves um, in relation to a matter because of an impairment of or disturbance in the functioning of the mind of the brain. So following the case of um, uh, JB, the test still remains um, as follows. So is the person able to make a decision? And in understanding that part of the twofold test, you then need to apply the section um, uh, uh, 3.1 uh, test. So is that person able to understand the information, remember the information, use away the information or 
uh, or communicate the decision. So that's the first part of the test. Uh, if they cannot, is that um, lack of um, ability to make a decision? Uh, does that person have an impairment of or disturbance of the functioning of the mind or the brain? So that is the um, uh, diagnostic part of the test. Is that is there an impairment in the individual? Can this can be temporary or permanent, um, or um, and it may be part of a diagnosis um, or, or a wider uh, a presentation in, in, in an individual. So is there a, a disturbance of the functioning of the mind and brain? And then question three part of that is a sort of causative issue. They have to show a causal link then between the disturbance or impairment that render that individual unable to make a decision. So that's a very brief, <laughs> very brief overview of the capacity assessment that needs to be undertaken. Um, and clearly that will relate to specific areas. There are domains around assessment of capacity in respect of um, all sorts of issues, including lit capacity to undertake litigation, um, to uh, an instructor solicitor, to make decisions in respect of care and residence, as well as care and treatment, um, in respect of social uh, contact or use of social media. So all these different domains of capacity need to be assessed individually. So capacity as the gateway um, to the court of protection. An application can clearly only be made to the court of protection where someone lacks capacity or whether where there is doubt about capacity. Um, and that is the very first point. Once it has been established. That capacity is, is clear or there is doubt around capacity that is an issue that you need the court to determine. The next step uh, towards the court of protection and the issues that you're asking the court to determine is is whether an action or a, a decision is in an individual's best interest. Um, and this is the issue that the, the court of protection may well focus on in, an, in, in making any decision, whether it's withdrawal or treatment, whether it's a treatment decision um, uh, uh, relating to surgery or welfare. It's whether that decision is in an individual's best interest. Um, the court will look at any decision before them and provides a framework in which to assess that decision. The court itself will not make a specific decision, but will only make a decision based on the options and the choices put before the court and the options available to them. Um, so going back to how you would then look at what best efforts, it's very much the same as if you were doing it at a local level, which most clinicians and most healthcare professionals do on a regular basis in t determining um, best interest decisions at at any level and that is just then transposed transposed to within the court of protection so the best interest checklist that you would go through for the court of protection is the same as would be considered within any uh, mdt and so in terms of ensuring that options aren't limited uh, making best efforts to ensure and to facilitate that person making decision um, has an input and and considering whether that person will subsequently regain capacity um, if they're likely to regain capacity, is there a, is it a decision that can be deferred until um, uh, that capacity is get regained? What were an individual's previous wishes? Was there any advanced decision or um, information set out uh, that can help inform what is the decision in that individual's best interests? What are the views of uh, his family and friends? Was there a Latin power of attorney? But in taking the views of family and friends, it's also important to concentrate on what family and friends say he would have wanted rather than what they would have wanted. So it's about what is in P's best interest and what they may have wanted um, themselves. What the impact is on uh, their welfare and social circumstances, um, the emotional impact and any option that is least restrictive uh, must be at, uh, clearly at the forefront in, uh, in considering best interest decision. So that process of understanding what might be in someone's best interest um, looks very like the usual best interest process that you would normally undertake um, in any circumstances when you're considering uh, best interest decisions under the MCA. Um, so the capacity is the gateway uh, and then the move through the court of protection is based on understanding and trying to determine and for the court to determine uh, what is in the best interests of P. So for Helen takes over. Um, the one last uh, point I wanted to make is that there are options available without going to the court of protection. There may be decisions um, or uh, treatment decisions that can be made without uh, 
reliance on the Court of Protection. Section 5 of the Mental Capacity Act provides a defence, um, although not as it states on the on the slide, um, uh, resulting from civil civil or criminal liability for loss and damage resulting from negligence, but it provides as a debt defence rather than a power for medical professionals carrying out the relevant act if, and these are the conditions, they have reasonable belief that there is a lack of capacity and there is a reason, reasonable belief that the act in question is, is in best interest. So again, it requires a, a best interest decision to be made. Um, and this can apply to a restraint as well, as long as it is reasonably necessary to prevent harm and it is a proportionate response. So what contributes a proportionate response will, of course, differ from case to case. But in those circumstances, there may be actions, and I'm sure you're well aware of this, we've come across these in your day to day practice, that um, means that actions can be undertaken without Gail or applying need the need to apply to the court of protection for the court to make the decisions and provide authority to to make a decision where someone is lacking capacity. So I'm going to pass over to Helen now to move you through and on to when to apply. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, I'm going to talk about um, some rather helpful guidance that we had at the start of um, 2020 from Mr Justice Hayden, who at that point in time was the Vice President of the Court of Protection. He's not anymore, but um, he's still um, extremely well respected let's put that uh, and that's putting it mildly um if those of you who have had anything to do with the court of protection will be will be familiar with mr justice hayden i am sure anyway his guidance came out early 2020 about when and in what circumstances an application to the court of protection is required and the reason that guidance came out and was so helpful is because for want of a better phrase things were a bit of a mess. We had the 2005 legislation, we had a code of practice um, with sections that were that were out of date. We had a few practice directions which came in, came out, um, and some case law which again came in, came out. So Mr Justice Hayden obviously stick to death of uncertainty produced this guidance and I, I do recommend it. It's, it's short, it's no more than um, one and a half size of A4 um, and it sets things out very clearly um, and we've done our best to, to replicate that today but I do I do um, recommend the actual guidance to you. So the general rule from that guidance is set out here. If the decision you are making as clinicians is compliant with the Mental Capacity Act, with the relevant professional guidance to the issue um, you're facing and the MCA code of practice, and if there is agreement, and when we say agreement, we mean between the MDT, the family, the um, individual at the heart of it, as far as they are able to discuss and agree their, um, their care. If there's agreement as to the decision making capacity of P and the best interest, so those two, those two fundamental pillars that Liz was talking about, capacity and best interest, the fundamental pillars of the MCA as a whole. If we've got those two elements, so compliance and agreement, the medical treatment may be provided to withdrawn from or withheld in accordance with that agreement without application to the court. And that applies regardless of the seriousness of the treatment. So it can be withholding life sustaining treatment. It can it can it can cover the very wide range of treatments that are on offer and and, and considered. Um, and the court is not a necessary step if you have those criteria as i say you're compliant with the guidance with the legislation and you have that agreement of all of those important people who are um, involved then the general position is that you do not need the court you already have the power under the mca to make that decision now i've noticed in the comments that somebody said is a consultant surgeon and we the clinicians decide in the best interest of the patient whether surgery should be carried out on the patient or not and that's exactly what we're saying here if that if you as a consultant surgeon are compliant with your relevant professional guidance about that surgery if there is any you're compliant with the legislation you have an agreement from the 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 people who matter most to P and the MDT and you're convinced and there's agreement about capacity and best interest then you can proceed and you don't need the court you don't need the court at all that's the general position obviously there are some exceptions and we'll deal with those now first lot of exceptions if the way forward 
i.e. if the procedure, if the, if, the, if the treatment, if the care is finely balanced or there's a difference of medical opinion or there's a lack of agreement from those with interest in peace welfare or there's a potential conflict of interest, you need to think about whether a court, a court application would help. And it is highly probable in those circumstances that an application would be appropriate. As you see, this is yellow, so it's not mandatory, but you must consider it. Um, and the, 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 the circumstances that come up in relation to this exemption, I mean, co conflict of interest very rarely arises. But the difference in medical opinion, perhaps, you know, perhaps the, the acute trust has one view, the mental health trust has another view about the way forward. Or perhaps clinicians on the ground within the same organisation have a different view about what should be done. Or, I mean, the most common situation is that the family have a different view about what should happen or, the or you know, what treatment should be made avail available to their loved one. I say that with some hesitation because nobody can force a clinician to provide treatment that, 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 that they don't wish to. You can't be forced by family, nor can you be forced by, by a court. But if there is a lack of agreement about the available options, then, then a court application should be considered. And if that treatment which is being considered, if it is life sustaining treatment and there is that difference of view, there is the difference of medical opinion or there is a finely balanced issue and it's about life sustaining treatment, then that's when it tips over into mandatory. And in those circumstances, an application must be made to to the court um, so that the situations you know, an example of that is, you know, um, uh, if somebody is in a minimally conscious state, has been for a number of months, perhaps a number of years, and the family consider that more effort should be made, but the clinicians have reached the end of the road in terms of treatment, in terms of care. Um, sorry, I don't mean I don't mean basic care. I mean um, care options. Um, then, then that is a situation. That, that should be put before the court. If there's a disagreement with the family and the clinicians about next steps, then um, a court application in those circumstances would, would be merited. Second lot of exemptions, special categories of cases. So I'd say this is, this is not exhaustive, but for the primary purposes of sterilisation, should an individual without capacity be, be sterilised? That is a case that even if there is agreement, even if there is no dispute between the clinicians, that is, 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 is highly probable that court should be involved. If the procedure is for purposes of donation of an organ, bone marrow, stem cells, tissue or bodily fluid to another person, i.e. you're really considering best interests outside of the individual that you're treating, um, that sh that's a decision for the court, not, not, uh, not on the ground. Covert inception of a contraceptive device or other means of contraception, again, that should trigger a consideration of court involvement. Where it is proposed that an experimental or innovative treatment is carried out. So um, there was a case a while ago about um, treating um, CJD and 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 how and how that was done, and it was a very experimental um, treatment, and and that needed to go to the Court of Protection in order to be um, approved. Or cases involving a significant ethical question in an untested or controversial area of medicine. Again, these are all these are all ones that are not clear cut. They're not everyday cases. There's some aspect which which carries it over into needing that authority of the court, that overview of a judge, um, and 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 shouldn't be um, dealt with um, simply on the ground, even if there is that agreement that we've spoken about before. So it pushes us outside of our general rule that we discussed a few slides ago. So as I say, it's highly probable that the court application will be required in these situations. And where there is a deprivation of liberty, um, this is a this is a tricky one and has been by no means clear cut. So when the proposed procedure or treatment is to be carried out using a degree of force or restraint, which goes beyond the parameters at, at set out in the Mental Capacity Act. A few slides ago, Liz mentioned that um, measures which amount to force, restraint, restriction can be authorised under five and six of the Mental Capacity Act if it's proportionate and necessary. 
And that remains the case. And it, what we're talking about here is when that level of restriction goes above and beyond um, just simple restraint restrictions. And it's and it's a it's a it's a sliding scale, and it's all relative. And assist, an assessment needs to be carried out pretty much on a case by case basis. Um, I did a case many years ago where um, it was an individual who had essentially become locked in their own home by their own um, disorders and um, conditions and they'd um, been and it was a first floor flat and there was a, a, a an agoraphobic element and um, that this individual had been in their flat um, for many years and every, uh, everybody agreed that this individual should no longer be cared for um, in their flat and should be removed um, to somewhere um, else to re receive a higher level of care. But the problem was getting him out. Um, and the care plan that the uh, health bodies came up with was to sedate this individual with ketamine and then to carry him out um, down the stairs using the, the 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 paramedics and the fire service into an ambulance and then to a hospital for something of a health MOT before going onwards to um, his own residential placement. And the level of restraint and restriction involved in that care plan took us over this barrier that we're talking about here, took us outside of the defence in the Mental Capacity Act that you already have um, and into the realms of needing a court court authorization in order to do that care plan. Despite, I mean, everybody was in agreement with the plans. I mean, I'm not saying that the plans were simple. It took a long time to put together, but everybody um, wholeheartedly agreed with them. And they were least restrictive. They sounded onerous, but they were least restrictive. And that was the important criteria for the court. Court said, yes, I agree with this plan. You can do it. It's right that it came to court, and I lend my judicial authority to the care plan, and it can proceed. Now, that's an extreme example, um, but you need to be reviewing what level of restraint and restrictions are in place. You know, for instance, is, is sedation required? Is it required for a, for a length of time? Is there some transport involved? Is there constant supervision, one to one, perhaps two to one going on? Um, and, you know, the, all the circumstances of the case will judge whether that level of restriction pushes you over into a deprivation of liberty such that it needs, it needs a judicial oversight. And you'll see the highlight in red there. When there is a deprivation of liberty, it becomes one of our mandatory. It needs to go to court um, for, for their um, authority when we're talking about, about treatment in this way. Are there any questions about that so far? There's been a lot. There's been a lot covered. We've got our general rule here. We've got our ex exception one. So this is a sort of conflict or finely balanced exception. We've got our special categories exception. So when treatment is unusual or there's a significant ethical question attached to it, it's not run of the mill. And then here we've got our deprivation of liberty question. Let's see what we've said here. If a person has a uh, lasting power of attorney, but the person who is responsible to implement the LPA is making an unwise decision, can we ask for COP? So, yes, I mean, we haven't we haven't dealt with the question of a power of attorney in, in depth here, but um, essentially power of attorney, as you all know, will substitute the decision maker for the person without capacity. As you all know, it has to deal with health and welfare in order. It has to be a health and welfare power of attorney um, in order um, for, for them to be able to substitute their decision making for the individual. And if you feel that that power of attorney is not making a decision in the individual's best interest, then um, th there should be a report to the Office of the Public Guardian for an investigation into that power of attorney. If you're on time restraints, which obviously, you know, if, if as a treating trust you are likely to be, then yes, I would suggest that an application to the COP is, is merited in order to in order to give you a legal basis to provide the care you want to in order for best interest to be considered for that individual and as a side issue that the future of that power of attorney might be considered as well. 
got a few more questions coming in here. A child of 15 does not fall under the MCA if the child has suicidal ideation but is not able to be detained under the Mental Health Act as there is no diagnosed mental health condition and ongoing disagreement for care package between parents, mental health services and children's social care due to high risk of harm to the child. Would this be a question for the COP? So technically, the COP, because it's a because it's a body that's brought about by the Mental Capacity Act, it applies to 16 and overs. So if we're talking about somebody 15, we're not usually talking about the the Court of Protection, it, unless there's an argument that the proceedings will will be ongoing, such as to go over the individual's 16th birthday. So there are circumstances in which a 15 year old can be in the COP, but it's more of an idea of because the main decision will be when this individual's 16, not 15. So um, child of 15, under the Mental Health Act, I mean, we're stepping outside the cop a bit here, but um, if it's not Mental Health Act, if you can't get parental consent, if you can't get, if you haven't got a Gillick competent child to make a decision, you're probably looking towards the court as just a brief explanation. So as I say, child, Gillick competence, can we make a decision from the child? Can we do an act judged on the on the child? Parental responsibility and their consent. And then if, if we can't get either of those, then then we would need court involvement. And it would probably be the inherent jurisdiction and the high court, which is slightly different from the court of protection. Is preventing patient from removing tubes by restraining hands so the patient can do it, cannot do it aloud? So that, that is a very common query. And I would say preventing patient for, presumably by applying some mittens or, you know, or, 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 or restraining their hands in a more forceful way. Um, that is certainly a restriction if done once. Perhaps it would only be a restriction if done, you know, immediately following an operation while somebody is recovering from the anaesthetic, for instance. I'm not suggesting that that would need to go to court. If what you are suggesting is a continuous and sustained period whereby you are manacling, I know that's an extreme word, but preventing somebody from using their hands in the way they want to, I would say that then tips over into a deprivation of liberty, um, such as you would require um, a court application. So it's again, it's a question of degree and timing. But as I say, if it's a, if it's a short period of time, um, you know, I would say yeah, up to a day and there's a reason why you need to do it, which is which is just necessary and proportionate. But if you're tipping over into the, doing that for a long period of time as a result of the individual's wish to remove those tubes, then you're then you're starting to flirt with the idea of a deprivation of liberty, in my view. If someone's mental capacity fluctuates due to their mood dysregulation, can we apply for COP or should LPA be applicable? Fluctuating capacity is one which the Court of Protection struggles with um, and everybody struggles with because it's really difficult. Um, and um, my advice would be put it towards the COP. If you've got a significant decision to make and um, you're worried about capacity, then we're in our zone here of you know there's there's not an agreement as to decision making capacity so if you're if you're making a big decision for that patient then i would say there's grounds to put that before the cop so you can have some certainty and as i say judges struggle with fluctuating capacity because it's a very difficult concept um but you would then have the 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 assurance and the safety blanket of a of a court scrutiny and uh, and a decision in relation to capacity and to how to move forward in relation to that um, I'm a special medical visitor for the COP. Most of the cases I see are in relation to dolls. What proportion amount of work for the COP is non-dolls related, i.e. medical treatment cases? Um, so the tiers Liz talked about earlier are, are quite relevant to this question. As she, she mentioned, there are three tiers, district judges, circuit judges, then, then high court judges. And um, the the district judges deal a lot with the, with the dolls, with the 21A applications. Um, then the, the circuit judges deal with the slightly more complex ones of those. And then the medical treatment cases tend to go to the to, to the to the high court judges um, because of the seriousness of the of the issue. I'm afraid I don't have percentages for you as to what the what the workflow is through the court of protection. But I would say that the, the dolls significantly outnumbers the, the medical treatment cases. Um, I hope that's helpful. If you if you want me to find some statistics for you, I'm very happy to do so and come back to you. Just um, email me after the event and we can talk further. Next question. What would be proportionate and reasonable? How far can one go to prevent patients' hands from removing tube without taking the matter to court? Again, I think it's, it's a question of, of degree there. Um, and... <sighs> 
you know coming coming around from surgery there will be patients who who want to look at stitches and want to play with 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 wounds and and you know I'm not suggesting that I'm certainly not suggesting that you have to take every single one of those to court in order to prevent a patient from from doing that um I think it comes back to to what I said earlier about that you know how long you're doing that for and why what aspect of their behavior is it that you're addressing how are you doing it is that necessary is that proportionate to the harm they're facing and take a view on that and it, you know it needs to be um if it is for a considered amount of time there needs to be considerations to how you can improve compliance, how you can make the, the measures you're taking as least restrictive as possible, um, how you can involve the loved ones, the carers of that individual to, 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 to lessen the restrictions if possible. Um, I'm afraid there is no there is no hard and fast rule as to what is reasonable. You need to have a look at the patient in front of you, what measures are necessary, how long you're doing them for, what those measures are and um, and, and go from there. I'm afraid. Those are all the questions at the moment. So I will I will stop there and um, hand back to Liz. If there are any further questions, as as you know, we said, and um, do do bring them up at the end, and we can we can discuss further. But um, I'll hand back to Liz for the time being. Thanks, Helen. Um, so Helen's talked about circumstances in which an application to court protection should be considered and must be considered. So the next point I wanted to cover was how, how you go about bringing a, 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 an application and, and what are some of the key principles and practicalities around that. So the first point is this, is that there is an obligation on the public, on public bodies to bring this application. It has been made fairly clear through the courts that um, families and advocates are able to bring uh, proceedings on behalf of the loved ones, but it should be if the if the criteria are present, it should be for public bodies to do this um, when it's in relation to P. Which public body body is a key question. Um, joint applications between a local authority or a, a trust or an ICB are, are common, um, and it will obviously depend on the particular decision that's uh, or is it is at the centre of the application. Um, it may be that you have a patient who is treated in the community um, but needs a course of action or a course of treatment that involving a, an acute trust so that maybe a joint application is appropriate. It will entirely depend on the circumstances as to who the appropriate public body is to bring an application. But just to skipping down a point on there, timing is crucial. So the, the discussions as to who should bring the application shouldn't be a barrier to making sure that the application is brought in a timely manner. Um, looking at documentation. So the Cornerstones of the pillars, as we've already said, to uh, an application are around capacity and best interests. But in order to have evidence of both of those things, it's really important to have the correct information and the correct assessments to be able to put these before the court. So a capacity assessment is clearly at the key of, of, of any application and this needs to be done. Um, uh, it needs to be a relevant, obviously up to date capacity assessment that's undertaken um, and details of best interest decisions. Um, and discussions that have been made in order to evidence to the court that the, the options have been considered and um, uh, all aspects of the best interest decision making that we talked about earlier have been um, considered. And there needs to be um, a very clear plan of action. So it is not, as I said before, it's not for the court to make a plan as to what the treatment should be, or what the um, conveyance plan should be, what, what uh, the actual specific um, decision should be it is for the parties to put before the court um, their proposed plans of or of treatment or plan of conveyance that they consider um, is in the best interests of P. So there needs to be a very clear and thought through and detailed plan of, plan of action in terms of what it is that the application is suggesting is in the best interest of P. So that can be down to um, as as or should be down to including as much detail as possible in terms of um, specific treatment. What happens when someone is brought into hospital? How are they brought into hospital if that's if they are currently in the community? Um, what happens on arrival? How, how is someone going to be restrained if restraint is, is required? How is uh, an individual going to be sedated? What To what extent? And then in terms of if it's, if it's a medical treatment, if it's a surgical treatment issue, the, the details of what is actually proposed um, in, in individual's best interest and all that documentation all that 
the planning has to be provided to the court to enable the court to make a decision. And that is partly what takes time in bringing applications to the court and, and can be a source of um, uh, issue for, for the courts if it takes too long to get that information together and, and, and potentially uh, attract criticism. So again, that brings us on to timing as well. It, um, it is really important to, to bring any application to court uh, in a timely manner. So you might be aware of some urgent uh, and extremely emergency treatment decisions that can be put before the court and the court can hear cases at any time of day or night if they are uh, emergency. But if they're not emergency uh, decisions or applications that need to be considered in the middle of the night by the judge, um, they won't be sympathetic to being woken in the night, in the night if, it's an, if, it's, if it's an application that could have been brought earlier, uh, should have been considered in advance um, and then uh, with appropriate planning to be taken um, by the parties involved to get it before a judge to make any decision before it becomes an emergency decision. Um, judges want essentially time to consider decision, they want time to consider the evidence that's put before them and whilst as I say they can make emergency decisions, they want to make sure that the right decision is made based on the right information with the right people in front of them. Um, so the, the key point of that is to make sure if you think that the um, there is a, a, an application to be made based on the circumstances set out by Helen and, and, uh, and in the guidance, then early legal advice or early consideration of that application should be undertaken to, to make sure that it is brought to the court in a in a planned and uh, timely manner, manner in order to make sure that um, uh, judicial scrutiny is it can be provided. Um, and the other point on that slide is who the key players are. It may be that um, the, you need to make sure that the right people are involved in any application. So that might be uh, obviously the key treating clinicians that um, uh, who are involved in the MDT. It might be a responsible um, consultant. It may also depend on social circumstances. So if it's an application to bring someone in from hospital, it may be those involved with uh, uh, P in the community. Clearly, it will involve any family or carers involved with uh, P. Um, and it may be um, to ensure that there's any other specific body involved in the, in the care of people who are also involved um, with the application and aware of the application and are able to um, feed into a best interest decision. What is also really important is that P is involved in a court of application. When I say P, I mean um, the, the person at the centre of the application. Um, so it is usual that um, P has is themselves represented either by a family member as litigation friend, but more often by the official solicitor. So the official solicitor, and this is the official solicitor, um, acts for P as a litigation friend of last resort, where there is no one else who can um, suitably and uh, act on P's behalf. Um, it's actually the case that they're almost uh, almost always uh, instructed on behalf, uh, in behalf of P. So the official solicitor is, is Sarah Castle. Um, she is one person, but she's actually supported by a number of deputies and there's actually, um, I think, uh, staff of about 130, 140. Um, the OS is divided into various teams, but basically the solicitors who work on behalf of the official solicitor um, um, make decisions um, and, and will be appointed to act on behalf of P. Um, their function is to carry out uh, litigation on behalf of P and represent their best interests. And they will be involved in um, proceedings all the way uh, through the Court of Application um, and uh, acting to ensure that P's own interests are represented. Um, it's a good practice to put the official solicitor on notice of any application to ensure that their participation can be uh, from the very start. Uh, and that can be done, obviously, if you're instructing solicitors, that would be done prior to, prior to an application to ensure that if when it comes to a hearing, they, they are on board with this um, from a very early position. Um, and the OS is invited to act by the court on behalf of P. So the costs of the official solicitor, um, unfortunately, uh, are usually shared between the health um, applicant bodies um, and the they will be responsible for up to 50 percent of the official solicitor's costs. So their, their role may differ from case to case, the extent of the involvement will depend on the case itself, um, but often uh, applications uh, will be driven 
uh, by the interests of, of P, so therefore by the involvement of the official solicitor, and they may ask for various expert reports um, and further evidence um, in the interests of P. So an application may have been made, um, and then this is just a summary to, to, to consider what might happen at a um, hearing itself. If an application has been made, the documentation has been prepared, the, it's been issued, um, you have been given a hearing date um, before a judge. That hearing may be in person or remote, um, depending on the court, the availability. Um, during COVID, most hearings, uh, or at least directions or initial hearings, became remote. However, there is now a move to them being back more in person. But again, it will be subject to um, what is appropriate as determined by the court. Um, it's likely there will be that the hearing, as I said at the very beginning, that the hearing will be in public, but there'll be reporting and restrictions in place. This will limit the names of individual patients or um, family members, but and uh, it won't limit the reporting on um, organisations and trusts. So, and during the hearing, the judge will review the evidence and the plans and the documentation that has been provided, and that will include hearing evidence from all those who, who are before the judge, uh, including clinicians, uh, the family and anyone else with an interest in peace welfare. And it may also include um, uh, the evidence of any experts who've been asked to provide their views. And going very back to the very start where we looked at the two pillars of the court of protection, the judge will then determine uh, um, either decisions, declarations around capacity and best interests and provide authority for um, for instance, um, particular care plan or a, a course of treatment. Um, and this process may be ongoing. It may not be limited to one hearing, often not. Um, it may be that it is an emergency hearing in the middle of the night, in which case a decision can be made or a declaration be made that an act is lawful, but more likely um, or more often perhaps that the court of protection proceedings are ongoing in order to, to obtain further evidence uh, and, and to ensure that the best interests of P are um, determined appropriately. So that's taken us through a sort of a, to the end of the hearing process. Before we just cover some case laws um, in, we haven't got a huge amount of time left, but in some um, overview anyway, just to take some key considerations um, out of this session. So, and some key points that might come up that might be useful. As Helen has set out, um, whether an application to the Court of Protection is required um, depends on the factors that are set out in the guidance. The seriousness of the treatment itself does not itself determine whether a COP, a COP application is required. It's dependent on the other factors as she's already um, considered. Going back again, consider the powers you already had. Have is it is a COP application already always necessary and in, likely not in every case, but it is necessary to consider it in circumstances. Uh, the point I wanted to make was around timing of the application, make sure that you think of it well ahead of time. And if you are considering an application, make sure um, that steps are in place to, to proceed with that application in a timely way as well. And the point about preparation there as well, um, making sure that you consider it, as I say, in a timely manner, plan it and make sure there is sufficient detail in what any application that you take to court to enable it to be um, uh, considered appropriately and with uh, um, thorough and comprehensive um, planning and judicial review in place. Um, Helen, is there anything else you want to add to those key considerations before we look at some cases? No, I don't think so, but should we just um, tackle a few questions before yeah. we uh, proceed with the questions? We won't spend long on them because I'm, I'm conscious we do want to get to the cases because the cases are the are the interesting things. So um, we'll, um, we'll I'll, I'll deal with some quickly if that's all right with you, Liz. Um, I'll start with the bottom. Basic question, please. Can anyone make an application? Does this always go through a services legal section? What does an application look like? Is it a set form? Is there a cost and who funds this? So, I mean, anybody can make an application to the Court of Protection. That's the basic premise. However, when it's about a medical treatment issue, the courts and the judges have been very clear that the, that the burden is on the trust and the trust shouldn't be shouldn't be leaving it to other people to make an application. So um, we get questions all the time where somebody says, oh, you know, so and so, you know, our patient's father, husband, son, relative has said that that you know this dispute they want they want a court to resolve um, and they're going to go to the court of protection. I can see why some people might think 
it would be an, a, 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 a sensible response to say, in that case, you go to the Court of Protection and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see you there, essentially. Courts look very unfavourably on that. They think, you know, a, a judge considers that the trust, uh, our hospital trust should be, or CCG, ICB, should be the one to initiate it. The burden should be on the public bodies to get a matter to court because they're better equipped to negotiate that. Are there set forms? Yes, there are. There are COP forms that Liz and I spend most of our days uh, working through. They are long, they are repetitive, but that's why you have lawyers um, to, 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 to do those forms for you. Is there a cost? Yes, there is. There's a there's a, an application cost, which is about £400. There's a hearing cost, which is about £500. And then you have to pay for your legal advice on, on top of that. Um, and as Liz said, um, if the official solicitor is involved, it's a medical treatment issue. It is likely that the NHS body will also fund a percentage of that cost as well. Um, question up. Uh, is the situation when a patient is ready to leave hospital, they do not have capacity and have a power of attorney for health and welfare who is not engaging and does not support any move? Do we need to do a COP application? Does not support any move? Do we need to... So you've got a power of attorney who you consider not to be acting in best interest there um, or in, you know, in line with your assessment of best interest of an individual who lacks capacity. So again, we're getting back to report that to the Office of the Public Guardian because of the power of attorney that you think is acting inappropriately. And yes, I, I would say that you need to do um, a COP application in order to, um, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to just press on if, you're, um, if your views are contrary to those of the power of attorney. So it would be, it probably would be a court involvement that. Ah, our local advocacy service, the IMCAS, have highlighted they want to be more involved in medical decisions, treatment for those lacking capacity or unbefriended, no significant others or with attorneys. Would that be the right direction given Section 5 of the MCA and the defence? It's understandably medical teams feel this will create an unnecessary delay for the majority of patients within this section. Interesting question. Um, so the IMCAS uh, will have to be involved in certain circumstances as set out in the Court of Protection. Decisions on the ground for somebody who doesn't have any support. Um, I'm not going to go into those in detail because it's 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 uh, I want to press on. But there are circumstances in which IMCAS have to be involved. In relation to the Court of Protection, it is very rare that an IMCA it does happen, but it's very rare that an IMCA will take on the role of litigation friend in a medical treatment case in the Court of Protection. It is usually handed over to the official solicitor at that point in time. Time. The official solicitor does have a general role, the general rule that they should be the litigation friend of last resort. Um, so, but for medical treatment cases, those those take a, a special precedence, I suppose, and the official solicitor is more willing to act in those circumstances um, for the for the treatment cases because I think, put simply, judges find their input helpful because the official solicitor is extremely experienced. It's a quick answer there. If any of these answers are too quick, you'll have my email address at the end and we're very happy to stay on at the end and answer further questions. But I just want to, to whip through them very quickly. In the more extreme cases that go above the standard guidance and a COP application is being considered, if the patient already has a representative for health with enduring power of attorney, re-health, would a COP still be required? I think I've answered that one already because um, enduring power of attorney, EPA, is the old LPA. You can't make EPAs anymore, but some are still live. Um, so you, you would need to, um, to give that due consideration. Um, and if you don't agree, if there's a dispute, it would need to be caught is the simple answer. Obviously, not appreciating the nuances there. When someone is to decide where to live after hospital, should we find a provider of supported accommodation ahead of or part of a court application to the COP? What is best practice going with more than one provider? Um, uh, I'm going to add a bit of interpretation to that question. If if somebody if there's a dispute about where somebody is going, um, they lack capacity and there is a difference in view as to where they should go, then then you should consider a court application. I would say um, if it's just uncertainty, um, there's not a dispute. It's just it's just unknown. There's some there's some questions. Then um, work that through as an MDT with the individual, with um, people who are relevant to that individual's life, carers, relatives, family, um, best interest process as as outlined by Liz, and see what level of agreement you can get to um, with that. Is the quick answer. How does this interpretation apply in cases where the Mental Health Act is relevant, for, for example, in the provision of drug treatment or ECT? Very good question. Um, 
the Mental Health Act and the Court of Protection have a very uneasy relationship um, in residence cases that are in the Court of Protection. If somebody is then detained under the Mental Health Act, the residence cases in the Court of Protection stop. They cease whilst um, the, the detention takes place and then they might start up again once, uh, once somebody's discharged. They might not do, depending on the circumstances at the time. So they don't they don't knit together easily. Um, obviously, the Mental Health Act is you know, somebody's detained, I don't want to say irrelevant of capacity, it's not an irrelevance at all, it's an important consideration, but obviously it is not a criteria for detention, it operates independently of a capacity assessment, that detention, whereas, as Liz says, capacity is the gateway to the Court of Protection, so we're talking at, at odds here, somebody, you know, might be um, detained under the, the Mental Health Act, but you might still be putting an application to the Court of Protection in relation to medical treatment, um that you know they can run along together um if they're about if they're on their own on their own separate facts as it were so it is it is a tricky relationship and it has to be managed um but the mental health act 1983 older legislation it does apply and it is um <laughs> it's uh, it's simpler in some ways i suppose is a is a is a quick answer and those of you those of you who know the different know the two legis pieces of legislation will understand why I'm being a bit cagey so I'm going to stop there but happy to take it up again later um, and hand back to I think that's the end of the questions that came in whilst Liz was speaking we'll um, we'll uh, press on with the cases and come back to them again Liz okay so uh, cases there's a picture that's not it um, so the first case I wanted to, we have a number of cases and, and given time and we will whiz through them, but the first one is one that was uh, dealt with by my colleague over in Manchester, um, who will know much more about it than I do, but in summary, this is a, a case um, around capacity, essentially. So it was around a, a 50 year old uh, woman who had a diagnosis of bulimia, bulimia nervosa. Um, um, and EUPD, uh, a background of trauma and symptoms of PTSD. Um, she had um, ongoing engagement with um, treatment. She had had a previous 12 month admission for eating disorder and protract, protract with protract, sorry, I can't say that word, periods of stability, shall we say. Um, however, her metabolic state was unstable for the previous two years. She had also suffered from life changing, life threatening, sorry, metabolic complications including a low uh, potassium level level which meant that she was at risk of hyperkalemia and cardiorrhythmia um, so she'd had ongoing uh, process periods of treatment including uh, um, detention under the mental health act in the, in the past as well in august 2021 she was discharged on a community treatment order um, for as part of a condition of that uh, CTO, there was uh, management of her hyperkalemia, which required her to be regular monitored, regularly monitored, um, and uh, in order to protect her from those risks of uh, hyperkalemia and cardiorrhythmia. Um, and it required a, a particular um, engagement in order to, to, to undertake that. So the, the, the regime that was put in place or was suggested significantly impacted on her day to day life. It was a highly invasive monitoring process, but it was recognised that but for those conditions, um, she would not, um, well, she'd die essentially, or that the risks of hyperkalemia and uh, cardiorrhythmia would be so high. So she did comply with it to a degree, uh, but however, that compliance was under duress. So an application was made by the trust for declarations around her capacity. And this case considered particular her capacity to undertake litigation. Um, and also her, and her her capacity to make her decisions for herself around treatment. Um, the uh, issue around uh, litigation follows, I mean, the, the, the usual decision is that um, it's unlikely that an individual will have capacity to undertake litigation or conduct their own litigation if they don't have capacity around care of treatment. So this, this particular um, considered whether it's litigation would um, could be determined in the same way. And the other issue around treatment um, distinguished that bulimia was different from anorexia and the treatment for physical consequences of bulimia it did in fact include this hyperkalemia. So this was around treatment of this particular condition. Um, this case uh, involved a testing of the evidence on capacity um, and whether it could be 
uh, used for both and it took into in, into account the evidence of both experts and GP and this particular case particularly took into the account of the GP who um, knew uh, P well and the conclusion came was that um, that she did in fact have capacity to both to litigate make treatments around her own decision um, sorry make decisions around her own treatment and and in this case she was unable to discontinue with um, uh, the treatment that they had that had been uh, provided for her. So it's essentially a case around capacity and the test for capacity and the in, in factors important in, in establishing capacity. And the second case that I wanted to touch on was uh, a COVID case. And this has been described uh, within the courts um, in December 2020 as the most complex COVID patient in the world. Um, it's actually a withdrawal treatment case, but where, where P had a severe COVID. So her symptoms were such that they'd left her paralysed from the neck down. Um, treatment was futile, burdensome and exhausting. She had um, brainstem and uh, um and all sorts of other issues that meant that um, she was uh, resulted in needing ventilatory support. And the issue before the court was whether that ventilatory short support should continue. Um, family disagreed that um, treatment should be withdrawn. Uh, however, the judge concluded that it was not in best interest for her ventilation to con continue indefinitely. He recognised that it um, that she clearly loved and benefited from the from being around her 40 children and that was a significant factor. But in the longer term, it was um, it was not appropriate to endure further pa further pain to be around to enable her children to be around for a long period of time. So the court took a fairly pragmatic approach in delaying the withdrawal of treatment in the hope that her daughter, who, is a, who lived abroad, could be with her, but um, ultimately made the decision to withdraw treatment. Moving on, Helen, I think that's over to you. Yes, this is um, a COVID vaccination case. DC was a young man living in a residential care setting with diagnoses of microcephaly and cerebral palsy regular respiratory illness and able to communicate verbally. Um, everyone agreed he lacked capacity to make decisions regarding the vaccination. The CCG as was submitted that it would be in his best interest to be vaccinated and the GP as part of that evidence described the risk of um, him contracting COVID as catastrophic. The parents disagreed and viewed vaccinations to be experimental citing risks um, and they just they were very very um, clear in their view that they did not want this for their adult son. Um, the court decided that it was in um, the individual's best interest to have the vaccine um, and I think that the lesson to be taken from this one is that we're on our dispute about best interest there there was no dispute about capacity um, all of the guidance was was followed the MCA was followed the code of practice was followed um, the relevant governmental guidance about the vaccines were being followed but because there was that dispute about best interest as to whether this individual should have the vaccination that's what triggered the application to court and that's why it needed that judicial oversight um, and there was an agreement um, from the court that the vaccine should should proceed. Um, there was um, a comment about urgency in bringing the matter before the court, um, uh, which is a matter that Liz has already dis already stressed, and I would I would add my weight to that as well. Courts are um, sometimes unfairly, in my view, because I think um, there is. Uh, I think, you know, applications take time to put together and, you know, putting together applications and talking to lawyers about them is not by not part of clinicians day jobs. You have day jobs which are extremely important and you must do those and putting together a court application in relation to things like this is, 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 you know, has to run in parallel to that. Um, one cannot be, one cannot suffer at the, at the hands of another. And those, these court applications do take, you know, this evidence does take time and we help as much as we can, but it does have to come from clinicians. And I think there is a, there is um uh courts are not necessarily sensitive to that and you know they they have the individuals at the, at the at the heart of the application as is as is entirely right um and delays you know sometimes are lengthy sometimes going into 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 months which should never happen um so but, but i do i do stress liz's comments about delays because courts are not sympathetic to delays and um things need to need to reach a court swiftly no matter what work is required in the preparation of that application and the next slide is a, is, a, is another vaccination case, but went the other way. 
um, diagnosis of learning disability and Down syndrome. Um, FZ lacks capacity to be vaccinated. Vaccination plan failed to address risk of trauma and disengagement with professionals. Um, FZ was um, extremely suspicious of strangers and had a history of re rejecting vaccinations and medical intervention. The court held the vaccination was not essential for FZ to live a functioning life and it was not in FZ's best interest to be vaccinated. So the same again here, everybody agreed about a lack of capacity, but there was a dispute about best interests um, and which went to, to be resolved by the court. So that's what triggered the application process. The matter was put before the court and there was evidence about best interests and what FZ would want herself if she were able to make the decision. Um, and it was decided that um, she 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 wouldn't have had she wouldn't have chosen to have the vaccine and I think this case especially when shown in juxtaposition with the with the case before demonstrates what a person-centered approach the court will take it really is about digging down into what that individual would want even if that is not the decision that the judge would take that we would take that you would take um, it's about you know the individual at the heart of it and it, it is very much person-centered so I think those two cases very much demonstrate that this is Regi, about a 27-year-old woman with a degenerative neurological condition um, in hospital since, since 2008. She was actually in a, um, despite being 27, was in a children's high dependency unit. Um, in December 2021, there was a decision by the court to be that she would, should be transferred to a specialist care home, a step down, um, an interim step towards moving to her parents' care and going home with them. However, the discharge did not go ahead. This is this is a case uh, which is quite a complicated history. It went to, uh, you know, as it says on the slide, it went to court first um, for a decision in December 2021. Um, uh, about uh, essentially about where sh where she should be and everybody agreed that it was not appropriate for a 27 year old to be um, on a children's unit still despite the fact I mean I think she'd been um, a, a fit for discharge for something like eight years by the part by the time at which the the, the case reached court um, everybody agreed she needed to move on from the unit, but it, it was where she was going that was difficult. And the, the family dynamics were tricky, um, uh, put, to, to put it mildly. Um, there was a very, uh, the, the, the dad um, of G had a very difficult relationship with the, with the medical professionals um, over, over a long period of time and it continued to deteriorate. So when the decision was that G should be discharged out of the hospital and go to a care home, dad and the, the rest of the family did not agree with that and essentially tried to sabotage that placement. So the court, when it went back to court, um, the trust in the CCG, as was applied for injunctive orders, i.e. prohibitive orders to, to, to guard against future destructive behaviour by dad, mum and, and paternal grandmother. The court concluded it was justified and proportionate to put in place orders to manage the family's behaviour and ensure discharge. For instance, they were, you know, they were they were calling up the, the, the staff at the, at the proposed care home and, uh, you know, making allegations about their competence. They were raising concerns through the regulator. They were encouraging media approaches in relation to this placement. And understandably, the proposed placement raised this question about whether they could really care for this individual and the court um, the court made an order to stop the family from um, behaving in that way and therefore trying to sabotage the placement and I've put this case in just to demonstrate that the powers of the court and, and ways in which the court can assist in um, in enforcing their decisions. So this was a case which went to the court because there was this dispute about where this individual should live her life and how she should be cared for um, and by whom. And that was the prim preliminary issue which was before the court. The court made a decision which obviously the family did not um, agree with in the end, and the court therefore were able to enforce that decision to make it to make it so that the, the the decision the court had made could could be respected and could take place, and this this individual could be discharged home. So, I think you know, it's, I, as again, I've put it in for 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 the injunctive injunctive powers there, just to just to make those clear. This is. Um, 
another case I wanted to mention, um, S was pregnant with a first child. She was a regular drug user and had a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. She had been assessed to have capacity to make all birth related decisions, but the trust were concerned that she might lose capacity on or before the scheduled delivery date. The court found that there was a real risk that S might lose capacity to make decisions about her labour and birth, the risk stemming from her mental disorder arising from her drug use. The court found that it was necessary, just and proportionate to make directions which permit declarations which permitted a cesarean section and restraint. Now, this is a this is a um, complex case, but one that I wanted to highlight to you um, just um, as a point of interest, really. We've discussed the capacity being the gateway to the court and that the assessment of capacity is, is, is key. Yet here we have a case where actually a decision was made in the Court of Protection about somebody who had capacity and it was about a future point at which they lacked capacity. Now, don't panic. Uh, you, you don't need to be making applications about everybody who you think at some point in the future might lack capacity at some point. Um, and indeed, um, let's hope that never becomes the case. But I think you do need to, if you're in a situation where an individual is going to lack capacity in the future about a significant event such as um, a caesarean section, do be aware of this case and do be mindful of it and do ask about it if you feel it may um, apply to the situation you're in. Just because these anticipatory orders, they are relatively new, um, but um, they, they could be key, especially in the context of this this timeliness of a court application is what we've been discussing already. So be mindful, but don't panic is, is my advice in relation to this. And then the last case I wanted to mention, Re A, um, this is this is one of my cases. It's not reported, um, but I've put it in just to illustrate the sort of stuff that, that we do in conjunction with the rest of the cases we've discussed about. And it concerned an adult patient in her 20s, she suffered from a, a learning disability, lived um, very happily and, and um, well cared for and supported living placement. Um, however, she did have a foot wound, long term engagement with podiatry and orthopaedics, but was largely non-compliant. Um, she simply didn't understand the non-weight bearing requirements and the need to look after the foot um, to an increased level so it would heal. And eventually, uh, very sadly, um, it became necessary to remove the foot. She um, had deteriorated and there was a, an extremely high risk of infection. Um, the care plan put together by the um, acute trust and the care team was to sedate this individual in her own home, remove her with a specialist transfer team to hospital, um, there to carry out the amputation and to provide um, hopefully approximately a week's worth of aftercare in hospital where she would be um, uh, restricted um, um, you know, highly, highly supervised, highly observed. There would be at least one person, if not two people, with her at all times. She wouldn't be allowed to to play with the wound, um, and she would um, receive physiotherapy to try and get her up and moving again. Um, uh, and 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 then to, to to discharge her home, and because of the high level of restriction and restraint there, that needed to to go to court. Um, court the court agreed with the treatment plan, and it was authorised. Um, with the support of the official solicitor um, that that deprivation of liberty was in her best interest. So again, that's just another illustrative case for, um, for, for, for the purposes of this talk. So let's go back to the questions. How long does it take from submission to, de to decision? Oh, what a question. Um, the quickest, let's, let's, let's do the good news first, the quickest I've ever got a decision in, and Liz might be able to top me, so it's a bit of a competition, is I think we got instructions at two o'clock in the afternoon and we had a decision at eight o'clock in the evening. That's the quickest I've managed. That's six hours from contact to order. Liz, can you top it? Do you know yeah, anybody who can top, top that it? One. That's our um, record. On the other end of the scale, um, there's some pretty impressive records there too. Um, court, the Court of Protection, I mean, like like everything, is frantically busy, um, and they, they 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 if you've if you've got time, they will take time. My my response is the court will will take however long you can give it. So I mean that amputation case I talked about, they wanted to do the amputation within two weeks. 
um, that was the you know past two weeks it was considered too risky to wait much longer than that so we the, the the process took two weeks you know we made the application we we had a hearing and um we put all the evidence in we got the official solicitor on board and it took two weeks these um these longer ones that that the one i mentioned at the at the a bit earlier in the presentation when we were taking the individual out of out of the flat that took months because we had months you know he was he was in the flat he wasn't significantly deteriorating he was he was being cared for he wasn't just re he, he just wasn't receiving the level of care that everybody wanted him to get but he was being cared for he wasn't in any he wasn't, wasn't in any danger he wasn't in any risk um he just wasn't getting the very high level of care that people wanted him to get. So that did that took months. I think that took about seven months from start to finish um, to get everything approved, to get the experts to to, to get him out. So um, it's so 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 I'm afraid there is no easy answer to your question. Um, but you say, so if you if you are seeking legal advice about a situation, it be, it will be one of the first questions that you are asked by a lawyer. How long have we got? When is when is it when you know how long is too long? When do you need a decision by? Um, is it you need a decision in an hour because somebody's in labour, or is it you need a decision within three weeks because then the risk will be too high? Or you know that's that's it's we will be guided from you by you, and we will tell the court the the time frame. Um, and we will do our best to get the decision in the time that you need. Um, but as Liz says, if we're coming late to the court when we didn't need to, that decision will come with a hefty amount of um, of uh, criticism. <laughs> but that's I mean, that's fine. We can put our hard hats on and do that as sometimes we need to um, and try and get the court to realise the the, the 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 timeline of events that's led to it. But uh, that's the that's the that's the answer, I'm afraid. What should we do if the patient refuses us to speak with family or lacks capacity to consent to gathering family views on best interest? I mean, if the patient makes a capacitous, a capacitous decision that you can't talk to their family, then you need to adhere to that. Um, it's their information and um, they are in control of it. If they lack capacity to make decisions about information sharing, but they have indicated that they don't want that to, they don't want that information shared, and you feel you need to, then there needs to be on the record a very clear um, evidence of a capacity assessment and a best interest decision as to whether you share that information and what for. Um, so you're back to we're back to our two pillars, capacity and best interest. If somebody lacks capacity, then you need to have that documented and you need to have your best interest analysis documented. And in that case, you will be protected. It's interesting that the vaccination cases have not mentioned restraint, which is likely to be required to give a vaccination against a person's wish. I would have thought the necessary and proportionate test for restraint would prevent it being possible for most people. Um, one of my restraint, one of my vaccination cases, um, we um, actually took that off the table. We said we're not going to we're not going to do restraint. Um, we're going to. Um, <laughs> use the element of surprise I suppose is, is one way to put it um, to avoid restraint because restraint um, made the individual made P in that case so um, anxious that actually it was decided that um, a, a quick sharp jab from behind would cause less anxiety than restraining the individual for the purposes of an injection and would cause less trauma down the line. Um, and the court was happy with that and said that, and it actually made a conscious inclusion in the order that the vaccination was being um, was was endorsed as being in the individual's best interests, but that did not include restraint in order to provide the vaccination for any period of time. So um, judges were very were very um, clear about the level of restraint that could or could not be used. And it was one of the reasons why the FZ case that I mentioned, um, the treatment plan in that case was was not endorsed because um, it was not clear about what what restraint was needed and why. So restraint is very much an issue that, that courts want to have a lot of information on. And if you are in a medical treatment case and you have got the official solicitor's litigation friend, you will find that they want a very high level of detail to the extent of how many people will be restraining, what qualifications do they have, who are they, what are their job descriptions, what method of restraint will they be using as a first port of call and then as a plan B and as a plan C. It's a very high level of information that's needed about restraint. It's a buzzword in terms of these proceedings. Um, I think we'll continue to leave. Da, 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 da. I think 
If a person lacks capacity to make decisions about the arrangements of their care and treatment, then a request for doles authorisation should be made. Our experience is that the process of doles assessment itself may hope to navigate difficult situations where there are LPAs who appear not to be engaged in agreement with proposed arrangements and help move things along. Absolutely. If you need a doles authorisation, go through the process and quite often that um, that uh, that leads to um, a higher level of discussions and a higher level of agreement. Um, and if it doesn't, the conditions um, on any authorisation may assist in relation to, to how to manage that going forward. So I agree with that point. Um, I think that's all the questions. Liz, did you ha think, have you seen I any more that all. I haven't no. seen? I think Are there any? Them all, Helen. I have covered them all, haven't I? I shouldn't have done. I should have let you nope, do some. I'm nope, sorry. That's absolutely fine. Nope. <laughs> I'll be in big trouble after this for hogging nope. all the questions. But I like the questions. The questions are their fun bit. Um, so uh, on that on that point, if anybody does have any other questions that haven't been answered or that you want to address outside of the group, um, I think um our email addresses are on there they are our smiling faces and our email addresses if you want to address them um to us directly we're very very happy to take them in fact i feel somebody should email liz a question so she gets the opportunity <laughs> rather than you know having them all I absolutely stolen. have no problem with that <laughs> but i might um, ask you a question yeah go, go for it go for <laughs> it <laughs> Oh dear, so I think that's, I think, um, slightly over time, and I'll take the blame for that as well, um, that's, that's, that's us. Thank you all so much for coming, I hope it was helpful, um, and we do, we are um, very keen to have feedback, constructive feedback, uh, please, um, but we're very keen, and if anybody has any sessions that they want us to do, I mean, I know we've, we've, we've brought up a lot of things today, capacity, liberty protection safeguards, um, lots of things that, um, you know, can stand as training in their own right. So if any session, if there are any sessions that you feel you would, would want us to put on, do mention it and we will do them. Um, so thank you very much. Otherwise. Thank you.